Well, Jubilee, I want to welcome you this morning to worship the one who has the words of eternal life. You have the words of life. We were praying um, concerning that this morning. Um, <clears throat> just the words of Jesus um, as, as he's speaking to Peter, 
and, um, and asking, are, do you two want to go? Because people were leaving him. And, um, and Peter spoke up and he said, Lord, you, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've left everything to follow you. And um, that really is the call of the Lord um, on each one of us this morning. So I want us to, uh, to begin our time of worship together here this morning, and I hope it will be just that. We were praying that the Lord, that the Spirit of God would so fall upon us this morning that there would be a, a, a worship that recognizes sin in our lives and the need for a Savior, and that even as we worship, we would repent, we would turn, we would call out on the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy on us as a family, have mercy on me as an individual, that we might proclaim you with our lives. So, familiar passage, but listen to the need um, <clears throat> spoken from heaven uh, to us at that first Christmas. Luke chapter 2. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Messiah, Son of David. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Well, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Has the Lord made anything known to you this morning? Which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Stand with me and let's pray and then sing to our great God. Father, we just thank you so much for faith that was given to these very simple shepherds. Thank you that faith was, was at, with a word, was filled, filled their hearts and filled their minds, and they ran to see that that which you had told them had arrived, a Savior, Messiah, the Son of David. And today we'll learn the Son of Man, a baby clothed in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger in humility. Oh, we say, fill our hearts, fill our minds this morning with the truth of your word. Fill us with faith, Holy Spirit. Come and work that good work in us that we might be a people of faith who say, Jesus has the words of eternal life, and I want to follow him, and I want to join in his kingdom and leave this kingdom of the world behind. So help us, enable us, come even now as we sing and worship. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, let's sing with the angels. Glory to the newborn king. Born in bad luck. 
Christ by highest heaven. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come. Offspring of a virgin king. Hailed in flesh the Amen. You may be seated. God and sinners reconciled. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? God and sinners reconciled. What a peace he has brought to us. And what a peace now we bring to those around us. A peace in marital relationships. A peace brought to our children. A peace brought to our neighbors. A peace to the guy who cuts us off when it's slippery out there. A peace. A peace because God and sinners have been reconciled. Well, Advent is a time of, of expectant looking. It's expectantly looking back to the beginning of our salvation, and it's an expectant time of looking forward to when he will come again, and it is an expectant time of waiting now, expecting him to be a part of our life, expecting him to work in and through our lives right here in the humdrum of life in Minneapolis and St. Paul. God breaking in, like that sunshine right over there. We, it's so bright, you got to ha- ha- hold your hand so you can see, you know. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful expectant reality that is ours. And so, as a, uh, as a pastor friend of mine in Senegal, Pastor Boffy used to say weekly, in the midst of a lot of hardship, he would say, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Exactly. But he didn't stay there. He said, the best is yet to come. You have not seen anything yet. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, Jubilee. I will come again to take you to be with me. So if you're a guest with us this morning, we just remind ourselves continually here about what we need to know um, in order to continue to hold on to Jesus and hold on to one another to walk in these days that he gives, gives to us. You know, tomorrow's not given, guys. Today is given. 
We see people just here today and they're gone tomorrow. Today is what he's given to us. And he promises to walk with us. So if you're a guest this morning, welcome to worship this God who redeems sinners like us and prepares a place for us in his presence. The journey is in a broken world. The journey is hard. And we need the help of one another. So if you're a guest, when the service is over, if you will stop by a table right out here in the foyer, there's a card, and we'd love to connect with you, but you'll have to be the initiator. Um, if you want to connect with us, and um, we'd love to connect. If there's any way we can help, encourage, uh, we would love to do that. Um, also, we're a family here, so if you're a guest and you have any questions, you can ask the person next to you or the person right behind you or in front of you. Just tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I'm new here. Are you a member of this family? And um, they'll say, how can, I, how can I help you? Yeah, yeah, let me, uh, let me help you in any way that I can. So guests, we're really welcome that you're here um, with us today. Jubilee family, here's a few announcements. We are coming back this evening at 5. All right, can you make it back at 5? We're coming back at 5, but don't come empty-handed. Bring a soup, all right? So we're going to do soups and salads tonight. You can bring a salad if you'd like. But, um, and then there's another important I point here. I don't know if I own one, but there's an ugly sweater contest that's also a part of tonight. Um, I think they'll let you in if you wear one, kind of like what I've got on here. But you, you may get extra points if you come with an ugly sweater. But we'll be voting on our budget for next year, so an important piece there. We will also be voting on um, Megan uh, Gruke as clerk for our church. She should be here taking the notes. Maybe we'll send her out if we need to, but she, uh, she's going to be our, uh, our, our clerk for, the, for years and years and years and years to come. No, we only have, are given today, right? And there are some other important items. Pastor John's going to share a few words tonight. Um, so would love for you to, to come be a part of that. And afterwards, we'll go downstairs and we'll have um, a, a supper meal, a contest, might even be singing some songs together. But um, another upcoming event is Christmas Eve service um, on, on uh, Christmas Eve. And that also will start at 5 p.m., I believe. Anyway, look for it um, in the update. Well, this morning we have the joy of a baptism. And uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, baptizing a sister in the Lord. And what I want you to do is as you enter into this time of baptism, I want to invite you to allow this visual demonstration to be a prayerful reminder to you of your calling in Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus have died with him to sin and have been raised with him to new life. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Who loved me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. So let's worship together as we witness this time of baptism. So, it's so dramatic. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I want you to hear the words from our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, given to us here in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. This is the words of our king, and hear it this morning. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember this, that I am with you always, always, even unto the very end of the age. As Pastor Dan mentioned, we have the great joy this morning of seeing what one author calls visible words, visible words that shout gospel, gospel, gospel. 
There's great joy as our sister Becca comes to be baptized in line with the verse that we heard in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. These visible words are an apt description of them because we get a chance to actually see with our eyes this morning. We get a chance to see afresh the reenactment of what Jesus has done for us, a portrayal of what the Bible calls baptism. And this morning I want to remind you quickly that there are two things that happen when we baptize a fellow brother or sister. Number one, baptism is the church's obedient act of affirming and portraying a believer's union with Christ by immersing him or her in water. So in other words, what baptism does is the church is affirming a person's faith. Listen to Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that as Jesus was raised, just, so just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too should be able to walk in the newness of life. In other words, in baptism, we see afresh this drama of Jesus' finished work for us in this picture of our union with him in this finished work. We get to see it with our very eyes again and be amazed and stunned at the work of Christ. Remember I said baptism is for two things. Here's the second one. Baptism is not only the church's act, but it's also the believer's act. The believer's act of publicly committing him or herself to Christ and to his people, thereby uniting a believer to the church and marking him or her off from the world. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, in all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit. And we're glad for that to be the case. I always bring this quote when I do baptism into the baptism pool because I think it captures well what we are doing here. This is how one person put it. Baptism is like a soldier's uniform, identifying him to his commander and fellow soldiers. It's like a wedding ring, signifying that God's people have pledged themselves wholly to Jesus. Yet baptism is also like a soldier's oath of allegiance or a bride and groom's vows. Baptism doesn't just represent an oath. It is an oath. It is not merely an individual ordinance, but an ordinance which brings an individual into a new whole of which he or she is now a part of, and I like to add, now a celebrated part of. So it's with deep joy that I want to invite Becca to come down and share with us the testimony of how the Lord called her to herself and how he's continuing to work in her that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Becca, why don't you join us? It's a little cold. <laughs> Hi. Um, so many of you here know me. I've been attending Jubilee for years, but have never um, been up here to the baptismal font. Um, so uh, just a little bit of my story. I was blessed to be born into a loving, faithful, godly family in the town of Loja, Ecuador, South America. Um, my family were missionaries there under the Lutheran church. And as such, I was baptized as an infant in our church there in Ecuador um, when I was just a few weeks old. I have no memory of life before I knew who Jesus was. He was a constant part of our family. But I do remember understanding the gospel for the first time. My dad um, was a great user of object lessons and visible instruction. And so once in our living room, he was giving this talk to a bunch of kids. And um, he used this ceiling light in our living room as representing God in heaven as this light in the sky. Um, and he asked us to reach God, to try to touch God and um, reach the light. And so he gave us all these couch cushions. We tore the cushions off the couch, stacked them up, and tried to climb up on the couch cushions representing our good works and the things that we did and like being nice to our siblings and not cheating on the test, all of our good works 
could not get us to the light. They toppled every single time, all this mountain of cushions. Um, and so he's like, here's a kitchen chair. We're going to try to reach the light by climbing on the chair. This chair represents all the religious things that you do, like reading your Bible and praying and go to church. And standing on the chair, my sister, no matter how high she went on her tiptoes or jumped, could not reach the light. Our um, religious acts can't bring us to God. Um, and then the final, well, another one was um, trying to p lift each other up. So our Christian families, our um, body of believers, we can't lift each other up. So a couple kids just like tried to pick each other up and we're not tall enough. We're not strong enough. And then finally, my dad came and picked me up as a, I don't know how old I was, five, six, something like that. And he's like, now I am representing Jesus coming and lifting you up. And he's a, he was a tall man. Um, and he picked us up and I could reach the light. And zero effort on my part. I did not have to do anything or jump or stand on my tiptoes or um, read the Bible or put any effort in. My dad just picked me up and lifted me to the light. And that image stuck in my mind as a picture of Jesus lifting us up by his strength and nothing that we do. And, and that's when I understood in my child. In my child's mind, that made sense to me, and I gave my life to the Lord um, that night. Um, so as I matured and grew beyond that little infant faith, um, that seed of faith grew with me, and my faith was put to the test when I was 14 years old, and my dad was diagnosed with cancer. For four years, our family sincerely prayed um, for his healing, and I took it, I just assumed that God would heal him, that God would restore his life, but he didn't, and my dad died in 2009, my freshman year of college at Northwestern, um, and for months, I questioned God, and I questioned his goodness, I questioned his power as God. I struggled to understand how a powerful, good, loving God could allow his faithful servant to suffer and die even when I had seen others be healed or um, had seen other miracles in Ecuador happen. Um, but God didn't heal my dad, and that was a big question for me. Um, yet God was faithful, and he met me in a very real way one cold rainy April night on the shores of Lake Johanna at Northwestern um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me um, that night and filled me with an inexplicable joy and peace um, understanding that I would never have all of the answers to these questions but that God was real and that God was good um, so that night, he challenged me to trust God with my life again, and I rededicated my life to the Lord that night. Um, in 2014, the Spirit led me to serve him in India for four years at a, as a teacher at Hebron School in South India, um, which I loved. It was amazing. Uh, but upon my return to Minneapolis, I found this church, Jubilee Community Church, um, and have been so blessed by the family here. Now, with my husband Caleb and our baby Abby, we have made Jubilee our home. Um, but we are not members yet because for a long time I hesitated to do this, to get up here and um, be rebaptized. Um, because I have great respect for my family and my parents' faith and their tradition of infant baptism. And I don't want to deny the Spirit's work in that or negate the value that that has had in my own life and my own faith. Um, but, oh, wait, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> okay, I don't want to negate the value of my baptism as an infant in my own faith journey. 
My salvation is completely God's work in me. Like a baby, I cannot do anything to earn my salvation. It is 100% God's work. Um, And it is by faith in the atoning blood of Jesus. But today, I would like to obey the guidance in Scripture to believe and be baptized in that order and publicly declare my faith and symbolically share in Christ's death and resurrection. Um, So thank you for joining me for this today. Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. What a testimony. Well, sister, I'm going to ask you three questions as we prepare to baptize you. Question number one, are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation of your soul, the forgiveness of your sins, and for the fulfillment of all of God's promises to you, even eternal life. I am. Mm -hmm. Do you now forsake Satan in all of his work and in all of his ways? I do. Third question. By God's help, do you intend to follow all of the teachings of Jesus and to follow him as your Lord all of your days? I do. Mm -hmm. Well, upon your confession of faith, it is my joy, alongside of the witnesses of the church, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, burying you in the likeness of his death and raising you out of the water in the likeness of his resurrection. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Let's... Let me invite you to stand at this time and sing. Is that what we're going to do next? What a beautiful picture of the gospel. Uh, I was reflecting on the fact that we sang a song last week called, O Come All You Unfaithful, uh, which kind of points to how Apart from Christ, we we have nothing to offer him. We are unfaithful. Um, But because of the gospel, Christ's work in us makes us faithful. We're going to sing, O come all ye faithful. So I hope that doesn't come across as a contradiction, but just a beautiful picture of, of what God does for us in Christ. Yeah. 
stars will brightly shine it is the night of the dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and ever pining till he appeared and the soul Fate's 
serenely beaming with glowing hearts by his cradle we stand so led by light of a star sweetly gleaming here come the wise men from The King of Kings lay thus in lowly manger in all our trials, born to be our friend. He knows our need, and to we this is no strength.
sing Christ is the Lord. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise His name forever. His Amen. You may have a seat. I want to invite our dear brother and sister Jesse and Janet to come, and they're going to read for us our Advent reading for this morning and light our candles. Our Advent reading for this morning is John 20, 1 through 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid, them, laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped and to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell, him, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my fathers and say to him, them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first, week of, first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. On this Advent Sunday, we light the candle that symbolizes joy. The greatest love displayed through Jesus' death meets the deepest joy of Jesus' resurrection. The cradle, <coughs> sorry, the cradle of his birth led to the cross of his death. The cross of his death had no choice but to give way to the crown of his resurrection and ascension. Jesus as Lord and Savior has risen to the glory of God and the gladness of our hearts.
Jesse's trying to sit down real quick. <laughs> children, if you're gonna, if you're here for a service for Sappins, let me invite all of our children to join our, our wonderful workers in green over here by the door. May the Lord bless you and continue to show him the beauty of his son as you all study about him together. Uh, before I pray, I want to uh, say, I didn't tell my brother I was going to do this, but I want to let you know that this is our brother Josh Taylor's last Sunday here with us, and I want to pray in our pastoral prayer that the Lord will grant him much grace. So before you leave, Josh, wave your hand. I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but this is our brother Josh here. This is his last Sunday among us. Make sure you go hug his neck, pray for him, ask if there's ways you continue to pray for him, and, and give thanks to God for the time that he's been here with us at Jubilee. Let me invite you to pray. Father, we have many things to give thanks for you about this morning. We thank you for the grace that you have provided us to even get here to worship together with your people. We thank you for your spirit who meets every single need of our hearts as we walk in today. He knows how we walked in and he knows what word we need, what song we need to sing. He knows the encouragement that's needed. He knows the grace that, that will be poured out through us to other people. So we thank you for the spirit who abides in our midst by your grace. We thank you for our sister Becca and her testimony uh, that we have just heard and are reminded of this visible gospel of what your son has done for us. And we thank you for our brother Josh. We thank you for the time that he has spent here and the grace that he has poured out on our body. And we pray that as he moves on to a different chapter in life, that you, Father, would grant him much grace, that you would lead and guide him by your spirit, that, Father, you would continue to work in him that which is well-pleasing in your sight, and that you would use him for your glory, Father, in the places where you would take him. We thank you, Father, for our, the, our brother Blake and Melody and their family and the ways that they have ministered across seas and minister even to us today. And we join in their thanksgiving for the body of Christ and in their thanksgiving for the invitation that they have officially received. We pray that you would continue to use them for your glory and that you would grant them much uh, guidance and direction of what you would have for them to do in the upcoming season, Father. Wisdom over decisions on when to go back into ministry and, Father, also many opportunities and doors to proclaim your gospel. And, and Father, we also add to our Thanksgiving this morning the Amdahl family as they celebrate their, their, uh, their marriage this upcoming weekend. Thank you for the years that you've given them and the family that you've given them. We pray that you would continue to grant much grace to Dave in the ministry uh, that he is, that you are planning him in and Megan in the ministry that you planted her in and that you would continue to grant them much clarity and focus. Help them in ministering to those who they are serving amongst the Little Earth community. And Father, exalt your name through them. Uh, Father, we can spend all day giving you thanks. Now we want to give you thanks for our brother Toph, that as he is prepared to preach to us today, we ask that you would take your word and that you would speak something specific to each and every heart. That you, Father, would fill him with your spirit, that he would be as one on fire with the oracles of God in his mouth, ready to proclaim that which has brought joy to his heart. So open up our eyes to behold wonderful things, Father. Help us to see the glory of Christ, that in seeing him, would we savor and would we proclaim that Jesus is our King, he is our Lord, and we yearn to praise his name forever. So be exalted in the preaching of your word now, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. One of my favorite shows to watch is Undercover Boss. It's actually a show my mom likes, too. Usually I go downstairs and she's watching a Hallmark movie, Cheese of All Cheese, and I say, Mom, I'm going to go right back upstairs. But when Undercover Boss is on, that's a different story. We, we love watching that. If you've seen Undercover Boss, you know that someone high up, a CEO, disguises themselves and comes in and becomes a common worker in disguise, just to see what it's like to actually work in their corporation and see if that's somewhere that they would want to work. And a, lo a lot of times the, the boss will have this amazing reveal at the end and try to make themselves look good by giving all this cash to these employees who really weren't that good of employees, but they just want to look good. And the funnest thing about it is when you watch the people, the employees, start to piece it together that I don't know if this is who he says he is. I think, I think there's, there's someone more here than the actual employee. My favorite, of course, is when um, 
Tom Ricketts, the owner of the Cubs, becomes a janitor for a day at the ballpark. And he works with the fellow janitors. And it's just hilarious to see the interactions there. Well, did you know that uh, Jesus also came undercover? And what we're going to see this morning in the book of Mark is that Jesus is the divine king who came to earth undercover, concealing his heavenly status to accomplish his humble work as the Son of Man. That's the main point I'm going to try to make this morning, is the divine king came to earth undercover, concealing his heavenly status to accomplish his humble work as the Son of Man. Well, the, the term, the title, Son of Man, is Jesus' most favorite title for himself. He calls himself Son of Man over 80 times throughout the Gospels. And what's really interesting is, you hardly see this title in the rest of the New Testament. And so there's mystery that surrounds this title, Son of Man. Why is it that Jesus chose Son of Man to be his favorite self-designation? What is it behind that title? Well, if you think about it, the term or title Messiah was a highly politicized title. Every, all of the Jews at that time had certain preconceived ideas of what it meant to be the Messiah. And so if he came and was open about his identity as the promised son of David who would one day rule Israel, what would happen is people would expect him to rout the Romans right away. They would expect him to judge all the sinners in Israel. And they would expect full peace to come at that point. And so the term Messiah was surrounded with confusion. And so to go undercover, Jesus chooses the title Son of Man. Son of Man is ambiguous enough not to carry the baggage of the Jews' preconceived ideas of what the Messiah should be like and do. And Jubilee, I just pray this morning that we will be amazed afresh at the humility of our divine king and how we also are called to follow in his steps. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me now to Mark chapter 9. Mark 9, 30 through 37. And what we're going to see is Jesus uses Son of Man both to reveal and to conceal his identity. Now the first reason Jesus uses Son of Man is to reveal that he is a true human being. This is how the early church writers understood Jesus to be using the title Son of Man. Justin Martyr says he spoke of himself as the Son of Man either because of his birth through a virgin or because Adam was his father. So the clear understanding of Son of Man in, this, in the scriptures is that Jesus is taking on a humble term. And that's, that's with good reason, because if you look at the Old Testament, all throughout, Son of Man, the title Son of Man is used to show the amazing distance and chasm between a lowly human being and the transcendent Almighty God. Listen to Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. So you see, God is trying to show that he is not like humble, lowly humanity. And then Isaiah 51, 12 says, I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass? So, so often in the Old Testament, son of man is meant to put human beings in a class that's very much separate and lower than the transcendent God. Anytime you see a Hebrew idiom, son of X, whatever X means, it means that you're a part of a certain class or a member of a certain class. So it's similar to uh, in Narnia, you'll remember that Aslan calls the Pevensies son of Adam and daughter of Eve. 
And the reason he does that is he's classifying them as different creatures than all the creatures of Narnia. So that's what we have in the Old Testament is God is saying, look, son of man means that you are in the, in the class of, of man. If you are the son of God, you are in a divine class. So it's meant to separate and show the chasm between us and God. And we see this in Ezekiel. You remember Ezekiel, over 93 times God calls the prophet Ezekiel, son of man, in order to remind him that he is but a human servant to the almighty transcendent God. And you could see that pictured early on in the book because when Ezekiel sees this amazing vision of wheels turning and eyes everywhere, he falls on his knees as though dead, and then it takes the spirit to get him back on his feet again. And what's amazing, we believe, this morning is that in this spirit of humility, Jesus takes on that lowly title for himself. The eternal God takes on the lowly membership in the class of humanity that's so much lower than the almighty transcendent God. Jesus takes up the term son of man to signify his true humanity and to identify with Ezekiel. I am but a humble servant of my Lord. That is amazing. This is the eternal son of God pushing away his status and taking on a title that's denied everyone from worshiping him as they ought. So for this reason, when you go into the Gospels, Anytime Son of Man is mentioned, usually it's talking about the humility of Christ, and it's talking about his suffering. So, in, in Matthew eight nineteen, and a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air, air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So Son of Man here is used in the context talking about his humble earthly work in serving God. Now look with me at at Mark 9.30. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he's killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Now there's a little bit of irony happening here, because you have the Son of Man, the man par excellence, being willingly handed over into the hands of sinful man. So there's an irony here. Now, when it says in verse 32 that the disciples didn't understand it, it means they really didn't understand this at all. Because look with me at verse 33 through 37. This is humorous to read. So right after Jesus says, I'm the humble, lowly son of man who came to suffer for you, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. It's like when a child's busted, they just don't want to tell their mom or dad. They know they're busted at this point. But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who is the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. Essentially saying, look, if you're going to act like children, let me take a child and use it to instruct you about true humility. And he said to them, if any of you would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So Jesus chooses a child because in his day... A child didn't have any social status. 
You wouldn't become friends with a child to puff up your ego so everyone would look at you a certain way. That's why he said to receive a child is to receive Christ. So take, take a moment and just take in the massive difference we have here between Jesus and the disciples. And before we do our eye roll at the disciples, let's recognize that all of that this resident in our hearts, this pride. Jesus sets aside his lofty status and embraces a humble title like son of man to serve and suffer for sinful men. The disciples, on the other hand, openly argue about who should have highest status in the group, one right after another. Jesus is so different than us. He's so different. The divine king came undercover, concealing his heavenly status to accomplish his humble earthly work as the Son of Man. Think about it. Jesus could have done it differently. The Son of God could have come and forced everyone right then and demanded that they worship him as king or else. He could have done that. He had every right to do that. He didn't have to come in a lowly manger. He didn't have to die on a cross. Instead, he takes up this term, son of man, to help us understand why he came. Later in Mark, it says, for even the son of man, now this is Christmas, even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When you read the Gospels, this is all over. Jesus teaching about servanthood. And Jesus doesn't waste his words. So the reason he talks about it so much is he knows that in all of our hearts, we are so prone to live for our own status, not only in the world, but in the church. So that we look a certain way to other people in the body. So what are, what are maybe some symptoms in our own hearts that reveal that we're actually driven by creating a name for ourselves on our own status rather than humbly serving other people like the Son of Man? What are some symptoms that maybe we're falling into that? These are from When People Are Big and God Is Small. It's a wonderful book. If you don't want to, well, if you want to be convicted, it's not a wonderful book. But it's very helpful, and I was very convicted in reading this. We might be living for our own status and approval of man if we think and feel overly responsible for other people. Or if we feel compelled to help everyone solve all of their problems. We get tired of feeling like we always give to others, but no one gives to us. Or we blame, blame, blame. Ask our spouse, when is the last time we actually confessed I was wrong? We feel underappreciated. We fear rejection. We, we live our lives pivoting back and forth just so we're not rejected. We feel ashamed of who we are. We worry whether other people like us or not. We threaten, we bribe, we beg. We try to say what we think will please, provoke, or get us what we need. We manipulate. We let other people keep hurting us and never say anything. We feel angry and always defending ourselves. We feel like we're martyrs. We become extremely responsible or irresponsible. These are all different ways where this heart of the disciples wanting to create this name, this, this crave, look at us a certain way. These are how they can express themselves in undercover ways. Usually when I go on social media, when I look back at my post, I recognize that there's some gross stuff down in my heart. So a couple years ago, 
I put up a video. It's still on there. You can still see it. But now you'll know that there is some sin involved in me putting it up. I was with all my neighbors when I lived on Oakland, and we were pushing out a piano off of my front steps. It's actually quite entertaining if you want to watch it. However, as I thought about it, part of the reason I posted that video was so that you and other believers would look at Toph Majors and say, oh, he's the type of believer that hangs out with his neighbors. He is obedient in that way. He's my pastor, and he, look, at he's doing a good work. Guys, we are driven by that more often than we think. That's why we need other people in our life to point it out. We don't, all, we don't always see all the ways that we're trying to create our own status with one another, just like the disciples. So how did Jesus do this? How can you knowingly be the eternal son of God and be content to take on a lowly title like son of man so that you can suffer, so that you can be wronged, so that people will misunderstand you? How in the world did Jesus get the strength to do that? Well, the answer is in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. So turn now over to Daniel 7, 13 through 14. How can we be set free from always having to serve our craving to be recognized by one another? To be esteemed by one another? Daniel 7.13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented, presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now this son of man is not as humble. This is a son of man who's given all authority. In fact, that description of his authority here is the same description given to the Ancient of Days in chapter 4 about the authority that only God has. So someone greater is here than just a son of man. It also says that he comes with the clouds. Anytime you read about God traveling through the clouds in the Old Testament, you know it's only a divine thing because only, only God is pictured that way. So we see here a son of man who is being compared with divinity. And for those who had eyes to see, Jesus was unveiling himself to be the divine son of man in Daniel 7. So Jesus was revealing he's the son of man as a human, and he was concealing the fact that he's actually the son of man in Daniel 7. We see this when Jesus uses Son of Man in ways that stretch far beyond mere, mere humanness. You remember he says, The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In Mark 8 it says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So this is... This is talking about someone far beyond human. And it's this vision of the Son of Man. It's Jesus soaking in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, finding his identity in who God says he is according to the word of God that empowers him to turn the other cheek, to not try to defend himself at his own trial. Listen to what bubbles out when Jesus is pressed at his trial, when his identity is at stake. It says, now, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. 
You ever been in a situation where it just feels like people are trying to find anything they can against you? For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Anyone ever lie about you? And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that's made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not degree, agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What, did it, what is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. How in the world can you do that? When you feel like your spouse is being unfair, how often do you just remain silent? And how much do you feel like you have to shout out why you're right and he or she is wrong? But he remained silent and made no answer. How can you do that? Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And then listen, this is what spills over. This is what was so in the fabric of his soul that it comes out at this most meaningful time. He says, and Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In other words, he is now testifying that he is that Son of Man in Daniel 7. And that Son of Man described in Daniel 7 captures his soul so much that it, he, it gives him the ability to not have to defend himself. He knows who he is because God told him who he is. He is the exalted Son of Man. Jesus also quotes Psalm 110 here. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You know, a lot of times we think, well, Jesus fought these temptations because he was God. If you're God and you're tempted, you just, I'm going to be God and do what's right. But that's not how the Gospels present it. Jesus had to act by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we saw that in the temptation that Lou preached about with the Son of God. And we see it here where Jesus, knowing he's the Son of Man in Daniel 7, is what empowers him to live the humble life that God called him to live. So as a man, Jesus found his identity in the, what the Word of God said about him, not what fellow Jews said about him. Jesus knew his reputation and status were ultimately in the hands of God. This must have made a huge impact on Peter. Because you'll remember, Peter was actually at this trial. He was outside warming himself at the fire, undercover. But he was there, and he knows what Jesus just said and did when everyone is trying to nail him unjustly. And so here's how Peter applies what he saw in Jesus at his trial to our own life. He says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And then he says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. He didn't try to push people to think about him a certain way and force them to see his divinity. Why? He did not threaten when he suffered, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jubilee, do we entrust our reputation? our status, the way people think about us in this church, do we entrust it to God? Or are we driven? We're driven by helping other people see how awesome we are. 
Jesus was high and holy, and he chose to be meek and lowly. Jubilee, where do we find our identity and our status in what people say about us and what we perceive they're probably thinking about us? Or in the word of God? We're set free because we know we are a child of God. And that's so much better than everyone saying, Hey, Tove, sweet post on Facebook. You must really be loving your neighbors. <laughs> Where is our ultimate hope for being treated, unju- for being treated justly? In what areas of our lives are we putting all our energy into being seen in a certain way or proving that we are right? This destroys marriages. This destroys relationships. This destroys friendships. Until we can learn to identify with the humble Son of Man because we so trust that our identity is wrapped up in Him alone. Otherwise, you can't love people. You can't serve people, and also be craving their affection at the same time. So I'll end with an article I I read this week talking about this. When Daniel glimpsed heavenly reality, he was thoroughly overwhelmed. What is our response this Advent? As we see with greater clarity than even Daniel that Jesus Christ, as Son of Man, is truly man, born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger, but also much more. He came down from heaven as Son of Man among the sons and daughters of Adam. Why? So that through his divine authority and self-giving, he might make us to be children of the living God. The Son of Man descended from the heavenly throne room to win a people for himself, that in him, and now he's quoting later in Daniel, saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. How then should we answer Jesus' question, who is this Son of Man? He's nothing short of God made flesh, who reigns in heaven, yet was born of a virgin, our brother and our friend. Jubilee, let's let this amazing reality that Jesus, the Son of God, is truly our friend and our brother drive what we do, not needing one another's approval. Let's pray. Father, we are so weak so often. (laughs) We catch ourselves being like the disciples far too often in much consternation about what people are thinking about us instead of what it might look like to humbly serve them. Would you change our hearts, Lord? Would you set us free? Would you help us to be so secure because we are your children that it, we, don't, we don't need each other's status. We can simply love in your name. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, Jubilee, we are, by grace, children of God. <laughs> Amen. We are, by the working of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, children of God. And uh, there is a calling, as Toph has just said, to the, on our lives. A calling, a purpose, a reason for life today and tomorrow if we're given life. And that is accomplished through a faith, a trust, as Tove just pointed out, a faith, a trust in our daddy who reigns in glory. Well, guests, we're glad that you all have been here um, with us. Remember, there's a way to connect with us back in the back. There's also a a free um, gift for you. I want to remind Jubilee family to return this evening, 5 o'clock. Bring a soup, salad, wear an ugly sweater if you desire and uh, return this evening for a a pretty important uh, time of gathering. And then also, I just want to mention that for those of you who've gone through some hard things, grieving um, this this year, uh, maybe you lost a loved one in in the midst of all that has gone on. Um, There's there's a book back here that the deacons have have purchased for you. And um, so, gone through something 
card, you'd like to read this book, it is there for you to take. It's called A Grace Disguised. It sounds a little bit like Jesus. A Grace Disguised. Um, really good book. It's been very helpful um, for me. I've read through that and uh, really a wonderful book. Well, we've come together this morning to worship the King. And uh, I think through song, through prayer, through the study of God's Word, it's been a wonderful time, a time of blessing, and the Spirit of Christ is at work in our hearts and in our lives. So now as we go out, we're going to go back out into the world, back out into the, uh, the neighborhoods in which we live, offices, uh, grocery stores, everywhere where we have life. And uh, we go as lights. We go as lights that reveal the truth. It reveals through our words, through our, through our actions, through just the, the ways in which we interact. We are light, salt and light, Jesus called us. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the, word, of the world. And we have a message to proclaim with our lives, with our, to our children, to one another, and to a world that desperately needs the light of Christ. So as Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, he said, Church, Jubilee, we'll put Jubilee in there for us. Jubilee, whatever you do, work heartily this week as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. So rise with me and um, receive this benediction from God's word as we go out. The root of Jesse, this is from Romans 15, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, it's us, <laughs> or to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen? And as Lewis would say, amen and amen. You're dismissed to the work of encouraging hope in uh, one.